So we're not talking about being immature. We're not talking about, you know, it's okay to be immature, to be childish. We're not talking about like that. But our, our whole attitude, our whole attitude is I'm dependent on him. If God had to fill out a tax form, could he put you down as a dependent? Am I totally dependent upon him? Or I'm grown, I have a job, I have a business, I have savings, I have investments. You know, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. No, God's taking care of us. Am I dependent upon him? So, children, I got I to gotta receive that kingdom as a child. Amen? So, take, take out your weapons. He do let his children, he, he, he has given his children a weapon called the sword of the spirit, the word of the living God. He has given you something to fight your enemy with, and it's his word. Amen. Let's make our confession of faith. Say the word of God is the most vital information in the earth realm for me. The word of God can solve any problem in this life. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to renew my mind so I can control this body like during the fast so I can control this body and that changes my life. The best habits for success is a faith regimen that includes prayer, praise, and meditation on the Word of God. Today and all this week, I will walk, I will live in these covenant promises. And they are at work for me. They're working for me. Changing rules, regulations, and moving around resources in order to enforce the covenant promises of my God. I believe this. I now receive it. In Yeshua's name, thus shall it be. Amen, amen. Uh, th this week the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to pass this on to you guys. He, said, he says, he, he knows you guys know this, this um, scripture, this verse. He knows you know this section in the law book. He says to live in the spirit or walk in the spirit. Y'all know that scripture, right? And you will not fulfill the lusts of my flesh. So he said, live in the spirit. I said, yeah, Lord, we know that. I, I know that. He said, yeah, but, but it's a spiritual kingdom that you're living in. And if you don't live in the spirit, you will not be able to contact the kingdom. Because you had to be born from above. You had to be born again. You needed a spiritual birth. And I have to walk in the spirit in order to function in the spiritual kingdom. It's an unseen kingdom. Jesus told Pilate, my, my kingdom is not of this cosmos. It's not of this world. So you and I are in a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom that I cannot see with these eyes, yet it has authority and power over everything that I can see here. I'm in a spiritual kingdom, one that I cannot see with these eyes, yet it's, it overrides and it's above everything that I can see. So I, I've got to walk in the spirit. I got to live in the spirit realm. And walking in the spirit, living in the spirit is not, it's not a look. It's not an action. You know, it, it's an inward knowing. It's an expectation on the inside. It's the words that I speak. It's the mindset that I have. It's the way that I love. Because see, uh, the kingdom of God, you know, the king, it says God is what? God is what? So the king is what? It's a king of love. It's a kingdom of love. So if I'm a function in the kingdom, I've got to love everybody. I, I got to love everybody. If I call myself a kingdom citizen, then there ain't nobody that I don't like, nobody that I hate, nobody that I can't get along with because the kingdom is one of love. The king is love. So you can't have a list of people you don't like, a list of people you don't get along with, a list of people you hate, a list of people you never hope you see again and hear from again, hear from again in life. No, not if you are a kingdom citizen. Your citizenship is where? In heaven. You're registered where? So there's, document, there's legal documentation on me in heaven when I got born again. He says that your name and my name is in the Lamb's book of life. That's why when you're absent from the body, present with the Lord, when you leave this realm and you stand before God, you know, you open up the book, the Lamb's book of life. Oh, there you are, Clyde Stewart. I see you. Yeah. Enter into my rest. Come in. Well done, our good and faithful servant. Your name's in the book. 
you know, where, when you register to go somewhere and do something, you know, they have a, a gift bag waiting for you. You know, you go to a conference or something, and they, you get a gift bag. And so the gift bag waiting on you in heaven is a, it's a gift. Of, uh, it's, it has a crown, robe, and slippers. No wings. I told the 9 o'clock people, start as a believer, as a kingdom citizen, stop promoting and promulgating that lie, that myth that somebody leaves the earth and they got their wings. Humans don't have wings. We're creating his image and his likeness. The father don't have wings. We don't have wings. And so when you get your gift bag, when you stand before God and there's a crown, robe, and slippers, don't ask him where the wings are. You're going to say, you see any wings on me? No. The, the angels have wings, not humans, not people. I mean, just small stuff like that. Say small stuff like that. It's the little foxes that spoil the truth. Believers saying stuff like that, putting stuff like that in a, in a memorial guide, you know, at a funeral, at a memorial service. So-and-so got their wings. That's a lie. That's, a, that's not true. That's not scriptural. And why promote that? Why say that? Why, as a believer of truth, as a kingdom citizen, why am I saying and doing all those little lies? All that, all that misinformation and, and, and ignorance. Don't y'all worry about the babies? Amen? Amen? Okay, let's get going. Turn, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. Verse number 17. I know it's all marked up in your Bible by now. It's something you're getting familiar with, more familiar, more real, more it's, it's sticking in your heart now. Are you there, Matthew 4, 17? Are you at Matthew 4, 17? Okay. Say, say the first teaching, the first public statement of Jesus. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began. That, if you begin, that means you're starting, right? So th this is what he started with. This is what he started with. He began to preach. That word means declare, announce, or proclaim. And to say, repent. Now that's not a religious word talking about sin. That, that word means to change the way you've been conditioned to think. Change your mindset. That's what repentance is. It's not coming up here to the altar crying and, 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 and wailing and, and feeling bad. And, and you sin, you messed up and I want to repent. No, repentance, the word pent, come up to a higher level. Where we get the word penthouse from. Come up to a higher level of thinking. Repent. Come up to a higher level of thinking. For the kingdom of heaven has shown up. If you're going to function in this and get this, I'm going to need you to come up to a higher level. Say higher level. Higher level. See, we never did that yet. We come up to a higher level of thinking. Come up to a higher realm and higher dimension. See, the penthouse, you go to New York somewhere, uh, Los Angeles, to a, a nice hotel, high rises in New York, Chicago, they have penthouses. They're above all the rest of the houses. The penthouse has a view. Oh, my God. The penthouse has a view that the other houses don't have. What, what, how, what view do you have? What view do you have of God, his word, and his truth? What house are you in? What house are you viewing the truth of the word of God from? Because, see, the penthouse view is totally different than the basement view. Totally different than the 15th floor, the 17th floor. See, when he says, my ways aren't like your ways, my thoughts aren't like yours, as high as the, oh my God, the penthouse, as, as high as the heavens are from the earth. See, he has the ultimate view. So are my ways and my thoughts than yours. So, Father, I want your thoughts and your ways. Can I come to the penthouse? Repent, yeah, repent. Come on up to a higher truth. See, believers, church folk know all about sin, sin, sin. But, but, but do you, forgiveness is a higher truth than sin. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. I brought it. When I came, I brought it with me. I want you to learn about this kingdom. He did not come to start a religion. He did not come to start a church. He did not come to start Christianity. He came to establish Establish his father's governmental system, his father's culture. 
You know what a culture is? A, a culture is a way a society functions. It's their belief system. You know, you talk about cultures in the earth realm. Different cultures have different foods. You know, different ways of dressing. You go to another country, they dress a certain way. They have certain foods. Florence, is, Florence made me a cultural dinner today. I got cabbage, black eyed peas, and, 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 and uh, black eyed peas, and, and, and rice and gravy, and, and, and cabbage, and, and, and cornbread. And, and, and I got that bird, that holy bird, better known as chicken. You know, that's part of my culture, our cultural meal. So, you know, the culture is your belief system is, is the way you live, okay? So now that ke heaven, did you know heaven had a cultural system? Heaven has a culture. And, and in, in a culture, is built on love. The culture is built on forgiveness. I got to forgive you because that's part of the kingdom culture. In America, you don't have to forgive nobody. You could be mad at somebody, not forgive them, not talk to them, treat them bad, because that's, that's, that's acceptable in the culture. But in the kingdom of God, that is not acceptable. So if you want to be a kingdom citizen, you have to forgive anybody of anything. Oh, my God. If somebody spitefully used you, I got to forgive them. If somebody hurt me, I got to forgive them. If somebody don't like me, I got to forgive them. It's part of the culture. Now, in this kingdom culture, there's no fear. He says, fear not, for I am with you always, always. COVID out there, I'm with you. Folk rioting, I'm with you. Political uprise, I'm with you. Fear not. He's not giving you a spirit of fear that don't come from the culture. That don't come from the culture. Not the kingdom culture, not the kingdom of God. There's no fear there. So if you're afraid of how you're going to make it, afraid of what's going to happen after the election, afraid of how things are going to turn out, you've stepped outside of the kingdom, outside of the culture, because there's no fear in that culture. Luke chapter 4. Oh, y'all quiet. You guys got quiet fast. This must be tasty. You know how everybody be talking and gibbering, and then when the, when the table gets set, what happens? Psh. Silence. So this must be some good eating. Y'all y'all silent. You know, amen is good and praise God and all that stuff, excitement. Of course, there's nothing wrong with it. That's good. But when, when folk get quiet, that's when they eating good in the neighborhood, when they eating good. Matthew 4, are you there? I'm excuse me, Luke 4. Luke 4, verse 42. You know, I talk fast, so you got to listen fast. Luke 4, 42. It says, now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Say the crowd. Say the crowd. Say don't go with the crowd. Say don't be influenced by the crowd. Now Jesus could have said, well, the crowd want me to do this. Well, everybody else is doing it. Don't fall for the crowd. Because broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to death and destruction. And there's many that find it. But narrow is the gate and small is this way that leads to this life. So just because the crowd is saying something or doing something, it does not mean it's right or true. It does not mean it's the will of God because the crowd is doing it. The crowd tried to make him stay there, but he said to them, verse number 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because for this, what's the next word, y'all? What's the next word? For this cause, this purpose, I have been sent. According to the scripture, according to that writing in red, according to Yeshua HaMashiach, according to the Messiah's word, what was the purpose he was sent here for? Not, not, not to get crucified? Not to get born of a virgin? Not the resurrection? Not the blood? And see, we've taken all those things, all those topics, all those subtopics, and we've put them ahead of the government, the kingdom of God, the culture of God. You ask a believer about deliverance, they can tell you. The blood, they can tell you. Resurrection, birth, virgin birth, they can tell you. Sin, they can tell you. Forgiveness, they can tell you. Tell me about the kingdom. What? And that's the purpose. 
all the rest of that stuff is good. All the rest of that stuff comes along. But if I don't, if I don't get the kingdom, if I don't get the kingdom, I'm going to miss the true purpose of all the rest of it. If I don't get the kingdom, if I don't understand the system, the governmental system of God, the culture of God, I'm going to miss all the rest of it. Let me show you something here really interesting I discovered. And I've read this before. I taught on this during um, resurrection season. Turn with me to Luke chapter 23. And look at verse number 50. And, and all these little gems, jewels, and nuggets you'll miss. But once you start getting your focus on something, Luke 23, are you there? Okay, now look, check it out, y'all. Have you ever bought you a new car, you know, new to you, brand new, or, you know, whatever, <laughs> a few years old, is it, you know, and, or a car that you like and you're going to get? What do you start seeing on every corner? And then you get the car, and then what do you start seeing? All, all the, you know, and they, and they were there all the time. You just wasn't looking for them. You weren't focused on it. But you see that car all over the place. And now that I'm so focused on the kingdom, I see kingdom everywhere. I've read this before, studied this before, taught on this before. But look at this, y'all. Verse number 50, Luke 23. This is after the, uh, the, the crucifixion. Now behold, there was a man named Yosef, a council member, a good and just man. Now Matthew describes him as what kind of man, you guys? A rich man. You remember that? Matthew said there was a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. Arimathea. How do you pronounce that? Okay. He had not consented to their decision indeed. He wasn't in agreement with them with the crucifixion. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was waiting for what, y'all? Did y'all know that Joseph of Arimathea, the one that bought the body, got the body from, did you know he was waiting on the kingdom of God too? I didn't realize that. He must have been at those meetings that Jesus taught on the kingdom. It said he was a follower, a disciple. So here he is now. Now he's waiting on the kingdom. And he didn't understand it because he, without the crucifixion, the kingdom couldn't have. See, remember he said, the kingdom is with you, but the kingdom will be in you. And the kingdom couldn't come into me until after the crucifixion. So the crucifixion was necessary. All it did was give the authority for the kingdom to function in my life now. But Joseph here, this, this rich man, this man that went to Pilate, and if you read the account, now, he went to Pilate, the Roman governor. Say the Roman governor. Now, when you think about a, the Roman Empire, how it was at those times, and you think about a governor, do you think about something religious? You think about church? No, the, the Roman governor... He was a political figure. He was under the authority of Caesar. And this man, Joseph, how in the world? It says he went into the Roman guards and said, I need to talk to Pilate. Now, our governor, I call him Governor Gruesome, Governor Newsom. I'm our governor. Now, although we live in California, you can't just walk up to the governor's mansion and say, hey, I'm a, I, I live in California. I want to talk to, I want to, talk to Gavin. Are they going to let you in? <laughs> I demand to talk to Gavin. You might get arrested. But here Joseph, able to go into Pilate and then procure the body of Yeshua. Joseph knew government. He didn't go there with a religious request. Joseph, I'm just me, a Pilate he wouldn't let Peter, James, and John. I, I'm Peter. I, I walked on water. <laughs> let me speak to Pilate. Get out of here. I'm James and John. I'm, we, we, we was fishing in, in our boats. We saw the miracle when, when our boats almost sank. When we fished all night and didn't catch anything. And Yeshua, we was there with him. And, and he told us to launch into the deep. And we had this miracle of this catch of fish. Get out of here. But Joseph knew how to approach the government. And got in there. See, the body of Yeshua, the body of Jesus, it says, Pilate, 
put a sentence on him, his body then belonged to the Roman government. It was property of the Roman government. They, they, they executed him. And here Joseph knew, he was waiting on the kingdom of God. He knew how kingdoms work. He knew how governments work. He, he probably had, had, had made a, a, a political contribution to Pilate. <laughs> Said he was a rich man. And you know, that's how you get next, do you know how you get next to politicians? So, 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 you know, so, so God needs you and I to know how to function in the government. I ain't talking about paying or anything like that. I'm talking about knowing the protocols and the procedure. And, and obviously, Joseph must have been up in there before if they let him in again. Amen? Amen. All right, now, um, let me show you something real quick here. Turn to Isaiah 43. Thank you, dear, because the, the, the baby's messing with the fo focus. They can't, I mean, my God, boy, I wonder how they act when the devil show up. <laughs> they can't, they can't, I'm focused with the child here. Oh. Isaiah 43, are you there? Boy, y'all turn slow. Isaiah 43, verse 25. Do you have it? Thank you. It says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Do you know that God wipes out your sins for his sake? See, we think he's doing it for us. He got to blot out our, our, our sins for his sake. Or else he can't deal with me with sin in me. Sin on me. He can't deal with me. So he got to blot that out for his sake. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your what? State your what? Do you know that's a legal word? That's not a religious word? You ever been to court or, or watched a court show and they say, uh, this is the case before your judge, case number blah, 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 Jones versus Williams. You know, that's the case. That's the, 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 the case that's going to be heard before the judge. He says, state your case. Why, God, why? So you could be acquitted. Instead of complaining, instead of being depressed and discouraged, instead of giving up, state your case so you can get acquitted. The judge wants to find you innocent. He don't want to find you guilty. He wants to find you innocent. So he needs me to get the law book. He needs me to get the testament, old or new, and present my case before him so I can be acquitted. When my daughter Z, Anthony's son, when she was in that head-on collision, I went into the heavens for her on her behalf, went to the courtroom because she couldn't, and I stayed in a case on her behalf. The doctors thought she was going to die. The doctors thought she wasn't going to ever walk again, ever be normal again. And I went before the judge, before the king, and as her pastor, as her father, I stated her case for her. I gave God strong evidence as to why she should live. She has a family. She has small children. She's only 40-something years old. You promised 70, if by strength 80. And I stated her case so she could be acquitted of a death sentence. One translation says, state your strong evidence. All legal words. All courtroom words. Your first father's sin and your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary. I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to its reproaches. It's a courtroom scene. It's a governmental scene. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1 while you're, while you're there in Isaiah. I'm doing all this, going through all this, reiterating all this so that your mind can get renewed to this truth about the kingdom and about the government and get out of this religious mindset, get out of this church mindset, get out of just a good feeling with no information, a good feeling with no teaching, a good feeling with no real structure of the, of the truth of the gospel message. 
It says, verse number 12, Isaiah 112, are you there? When you come to appear before me. Now, what does that remind you of? Anybody ever been to court? Anybody ever had a case? Don't raise your hand too high. <laughs> Say decades ago. Decades. Say when he was a teenager. I had a case. I didn't tell you to say that part. I had a case. And I had to appear before this judge. He says, when you come to appear before me, when you come into this courtroom, when you come under this governmental system, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the sabbats, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure the iniquity and the sacred meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I am weary of you bringing them to me. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Look at this, y'all. Look at this. Stop bringing all that religious stuff to me. Bring me some evidence. Don't bring your religion to me. Don't bring your church allergy to me. Bring me evidence. I'm tired of it. I don't want to hear that. Matter of fact, I'm going to hide my eyes and close my ears to that. Praying. I don't, I don't want to hear your religious prayers. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings. From before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Say the culture. Seek justice. Say the culture. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of Elohim has spoken. He's talking about you coming before him in the correct manner, the right way. We've been taught to come to him this religious way, this church way, this Christianity way, instead of a legal way, a courtroom scene, a, a place where you can change a verdict. Turn to, first, turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. We, we looked at this at Bible study. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. If you have not seen Bible study Wednesday the 30th on Facebook, get that, look at that Bible study, listen to that Bible study, Wednesday, September 30th on Facebook. It was mind-boggling, it was over the top, it was awesome, it was revelation after revelation. Look at that Bible study on Wednesday, September the 30th. Second Kings chapter 20, are you there? It says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. Say it's serious. Say it's serious. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says Elohim, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Say, uh oh. Say, God has spoken. Say, end of the show. Say, it's all over. What can I do? Then he, Hezekiah, turned his face toward the wall. He didn't want to see nobody else. He didn't want to hear from nobody else. He had to get his focus straight. This is serious. God says, I'm going to die. This is my last day on earth, and I'm not ready for this. I don't want this yet. So he turned his face to the wall. He didn't want to see nobody else's expression. He didn't want to hear nobody else's opinion. I want to hear from God. He turned his face toward the wall and prayed to Adonai saying, remember now, O Lord. Remember we read, put me in remembrance. God ain't got a bad memory, but that's what you do to state your case in the government. He says, remember now, O Lord, I pray how I walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And he cried and wept bitterly. Look at Pastor. Notice that he didn't cry until after he had stated his case. See, you come in the courtroom crying. 
You come in and pray, oh, Lord, my daughter Z going to die. Oh, the girl going to die. The doctor says she going to die. Oh. I didn't go into the, I didn't present myself like that to him. Nothing wrong with crying, but cry after you went, after the case is over, didn't cry. You know, you're in the courtroom crying and making a bunch of noise. You know what the judge says? I ain't got my gavel in here. We're going to take a recess for the witness to get their composure. Because I, I don't know what they're going to say. They're too emotional. Yeah, they ain't going to get their case. They ain't going to give a good testimony. Crying and hollering and emotional and scared and panicking. So a good lawyer will say, Lord, judge, before the judge do it, a good lawyer will say, um, Your Honor, can we have a, can, can we have a res recess while I consult with my client? So you think God's holding something up for you, but Jesus has stood up and asked for a recess till you get your testimony together. Until you get your statement, your witness statement together, because your emotions, you're going to say the wrong thing. The wrong thing going to come out of your mouth. You're going to make the wrong testimony because you're too emotional. You're too caught up in your situation. And the judge don't want crying in his courtroom. So, he, so Hezekiah stated his case. And he cried after the case after the case was heard. And it happened, verse four, before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, "Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people." Thus says Adonai, the Elohim of David, your father, I have heard your prayer or petition. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord and I will add to your days. God will add what to his days? He went from dying to what? 15 years. He changed the king's mind. He changed the verdict. He changed the outcome all by stating his case now if you're religious if you're churched out if you are bound ca caught up in Christianity and religious rules oh you can't tell God nothing you can't do that tell God nothing oh I got evidence oh, oh don't tell me I got evidence what is this is this a lie if this is a lie what else is a lie if this ain't true what else ain't true that one just for Hezekiah, just tell Hezekiah why we need to know. If I can't utilize his word, his truth, his laws like this. Oh, Father, according to Hezekiah, chapter 20, subsections 1 through 5, I can ask, ask for extended life. I can ask for healing. See, God needed Hezekiah here for another 15 years because Hezekiah was more useful to God here than there. Why would, he, why would he put healing in here? Because he wants you to last. How many people would have died and been gone if they hadn't got healed? Through God or went to a hospital or a doctor and extended their life? Because you're more useful here. He said, if, if my people who are called by my name, if they would humble themselves and repent and pray, I'll restore their land. So he ain't looking for the world and the sinners and, and all them folk to, to humble themselves and pray. He ain't looking for his people to do it. See, the earth got seven point something billion people. All of them ain't his. He looking for us to fast, us to pray, us to seek his face. I'm going to do a quick fast teaching uh, on fasting, a quick fast teaching on fasting next Sunday, you know, and so, so everybody, you'll know exactly what you're doing and what the scripture says about it, but, but, this, but this fasting and praying, you know, seeking his face. See, fasting and seeking his face, two different things. Praying, petitioning, that's, that's another subcategory, subtitle. But if my, my people... Ain't nobody else praying. As long as you, you praying. So we're fixing to move into this last little part here. I got about 13 minutes. Or more. <laughs> Be free. Leave whenever you want to. Whenever you need to. Amen. You're not locked in here. The door ain't locked. Ain't no chain to the pew. 
Come and go as you need to. Now watch this. We're going we go to talk about this thing called prayer now. Do you know that Yeshua, Jesus said that his house should be a house of what? A house of what? Now, nothing wrong with this, but we didn't turn it into a house of worship. You know, that's what they say. Where do you worship? And the question should be, where do you pray? My house is to be a house of what? Prayer. Nothing wrong with worshiping. We worship in here. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. But we got stuff out of order. We got stuff misplaced. You know, you got stuff in order in your house for a reason. You know, you got the nice spoons spoon and forks here, the dishes here, the glasses here, the pots and pans there, the food in the pantry. The, the reason you got stuff organized so you can go get it, you know where it's at. You got order. Your, your bedding outside, your bedding in the garage is in the bedroom. So worship is a part of the house, but prayer is the first part of the house. His house, his, my house should be a house of prayer. And we didn't turn it into worship, house, Praise house, meeting house, church house. Because see, most believers don't want to pray. Because most believers don't get the results when they pray. It's a waste of time to them. You ain't got to say amen. It, it, you know, the, the smallest meeting in any church is the prayer meeting. Two or three old ladies show up. Maybe an old man. Why? Because they ain't got nothing else to do. They old. Young, you got stuff to do. You got places to go. You got things to do, places to be. You know, prayer, I got time for prayer. That's for the old folk. That's what folk ain't got nothing to do. But see, you don't understand that prayer, petitioning, is a large part of the culture, of the kingdom of God. That's a large part of it. But if I just think it's a religious act, a church act, and it's not a kingdom act, prayer don't mean that much to me, and I ain't getting results anyway. You know, most believers treat, treat prayer like a vending machine. You go to that machine to get some DeSante water. Usually that's the brand in there. Uh, get your Snickers and bag of Doritos. And you put that dollar in there, she probably had two dollars, in that vending machine, and your product don't come out. What do most people do? Try it again. Well, this going to work this time. You didn't get your prayers answered. What you going to do? Uh, I'm going to try it again. And then... Nothing happens. You don't get that water, that candy bar, those chips. Then what you do? You're at home shaking, trying to, you, you're doing all kinds of stuff, getting anointed or trying to change up. And then when it don't work, then you start kicking it. You, know, you kick that machine. You know, do, doing anything and everything you can to try to get it and nothing comes out. Then what do you do? Walk away disappointed. I ain't going back to that machine no more. I ain't praying no more. I'm not getting the results. Something's wrong. Something wrong with me, something wrong with God, or something wrong with praying. All right, that was my opening statement. Let's go to the service now. <laughs> Turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Can I throw one other thing in there real quick with you so you can um, get this? We're going to go to Luke chapter 11, like I said. That's where the so-called Lord's Prayer is. But before you go to Luke 11, go ahead and find it. Put your hand there. Go to Matthew 24, and I want you to see this as, as part of the understanding of the kingdom. Luke 24, are you there? Excuse me, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Then we're going to go to Luke 11. Matthew 24, verse number 11. It says, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he, say I'm a he. Say I'm one of the he's. But he or she who endures to the end shall be delivered, protected, helped, etc. Watch this, y'all. And this gospel of what, y'all? This gospel of what? Did you know it was a gospel about the kingdom? 
You thought it was the gospel about Jesus. The, the gospel about healing. The gospel about salvation. The gospel about resurrection. The gospel about going to heaven. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel message is the kingdom. The good news is the kingdom is in you. That's the gospel. That's the message. That's the purpose he came. That's what he was teaching on. This gospel of the kingdom. But we wanted something else. Got something else. This gospel of the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom. It will be preached in all the world as a witness, legal statement, to all the nations. Say all the nations. Now look at Pastor. If it was something about church or religion, do all the nations need to know about that? No. But since this is about a kingdom and a king, all the nations need to know about this. All the governments need to know about this. Now, there's nothing wrong with nations. It's the systems in the nations that are bad. It's the systems in the nations that are corrupt. The systems, not the nations. Nothing's wrong with America. It's the system of democracy, the political system, the political structure, the money and the power, the deception and the lies. That's, that's the evil part of it. The agenda of it. Kicking God out of it. That's the evil part of the system. That's why if your confidence is in November the 3rd, as a believer, you are really tripping and deceived. If your hope, your hope is resting in November 3rd, something wrong with you. Not the world, not the world. It's something wrong with you as a believer. If your hope and confidence is in something happening in November the 3rd, something going to change November the 4th, you are tripping. Satan ain't changing November the 4th. The God of this world ain't changing November the 4th. But that demon in the media, that political demon in government has got people brainwashed and fooled that something's going to change and be different after November the 3rd. Whatever side of the fence you're sitting on. Because the God of this world ain't changing. And the God of this world has deceived the minds of the people, at least they would see. And understand the truth. Believers rest in their hope in November the 4th. Whatever side defense they own. The devil go change November 4th. The God of this world will be nice starting November the 4th. November the 4th, the devil going to leave us alone. November the 4th, God can really start moving now. No, God, God just waiting on November the 4th so he could be God. Please. See, first only white men could vote, then the blacks could vote, and then the women got the right to vote. Did you know, did you know that, um, um, what's his name? Oh, my God, not Frederick Douglass. Was it Frederick? Not Frederick. Was it Frederick? Anyway, he was, um, the lady McPherson, I was reading an article about her and him having a debate about holding back one or the other so the women could get the vote first or the blacks can get the vote first, and then they would work together, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I thought that was an interesting article. Was it Frederick Douglass or Amy, Amy McPherson? Yeah, okay. So that was just so interesting to me. But watch this. And that was in, a, how long ago was that? A hundred years ago or more? So check it out. So they've been voting for over a hundred years. Ain't things nice? Hey, ain't things better? Ain't life wonderful and beautiful and fair and equitable for everybody? We've been voting. I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm a vote. But my, I'm, I'm praying for God's will. I'm praying for godliness and peace and quietness to reign. Because both sides of the, of the fence, people have gone loony, deceived, in darkness, tricked. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then, say and then. Y'all want to know when the end of the world is going to be? Jesus just told you. After the kingdom is preached to all the nations. 
And anything and everything but the kingdom has been preached. So unpack your bags. You better go to work tomorrow. Go ahead and make that car. No, I ain't paying my car no more. No, no more. Jesus coming back. You better pay that car. No, it ain't nowhere close to the end. I'm quitting my job. You better keep your job. You ain't nowhere close to the end. The gospel has not been preached to all the nations. The gospel ain't been preached here. The kingdom ain't been preached here. Jesus, hurry back. Come on back. Lord, come back. Come back. Lord, come back. Ain't close. Because the gospel of the kingdom has not been preached to all the nations. Church, religion, Christianity, all the other kind of stuff. Whew, that was a lot, y'all. <sighs> now go to Luke 11. Are you here? Do you want this? According to Jesus, when the kingdom is preached, the people want it. According to Jesus. That when the kingdom is preached, he said the people want it. They want to enter into that. See, people know about church. They know about Christianity. They know about all that stuff. And folk, nah, they don't want that. When they hear about this kingdom, they want it. And he said that religious people try to keep you out of the kingdom. They won't enter it themselves, and they try to keep you out of it. You got to understand you are in a... Me and Florence have been having a lot of debates and questions, not bad or whatever, but just trying to get clarity, and she wants understanding about it, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a, it's a place. Heaven's a place. Heaven's more real than this because heaven was before this. The spirit realm is over this because the spirit realm was before this realm. This realm can only exist because of that realm. This realm ain't holding that realm together. That realm is holding this together. It says that the word of God is upholding everything. Every atom, every cell, every molecule is being held together by his word. His spiritual word of life is holding everything together. This ain't nothing. This is temporary. And people put all their hope and trust in this temporary realm. In their stuff. Ain't taking nothing with you. You would think, like when Zeno show up, you would think that God would at least put a diaper. You, you show up with nothing. Ain't got no clothes on. You brought nothing in, and guess what? Ain't taking nothing out and will fight and worry. Why do you worry about what you're going to... That's not... Worry's not part of his culture. If you're worrying, you're functioning in the wrong kingdom. America allows worrying. Worrying is okay here. But if you got worry in your life about your kids, about anything, about everything, you are not in the kingdom. You've stepped outside of it. Because worry is not a part of that culture. He says, take no thought about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. You know what the word Jesus used was? He says, pagans, godless people worry about tomorrow. Uh-oh. If I asked anybody to show their hand who's, who, who's, who is godless, you wouldn't raise your hand. You wouldn't raise your hand. You don't think you're godless. But Jesus said, if you're worrying about tomorrow, you ain't got no father. Orphans worry about tomorrow. What they're going to eat, what they're going to wear. He said, what you got to do, here, here, here's, some, here's some revelation. Seek, pursue, discover, find the kingdom, and that righteousness. And he says, when you find the kingdom, everything in the kingdom. I'm worried about stuff. I'm worried about things and it's in the kingdom. I'm trying to get it, fighting st stress and anxiety, worry, fear, staying up at night about things, about stuff. And it's in the kingdom. It's in his culture. It's in his governmental system. When you find out the word father here in a minute, you will understand clearly what I'm talking about. He says the godless worry about tomorrow. Take no thought for tomorrow. We don't have permission in his kingdom to worry about tomorrow. That's not part of his system. The godless do that. And I'm not godless, so I won't worry about tomorrow. He's distributed to you and I faith for today. Now, faith is the substance things hoped for. You don't have faith for tomorrow. If you thought you did, you were deceived. You do not have any faith for tomorrow. When you wake up tomorrow morning, God gives you permission to live. When new mercy wakes you up in the morning, he go dispense to you the faith you need for that day. Listen, oh my God, that was good. When you wake up in the morning, if God gives you permission to see Monday, when new mercy wakes you up, you know his mercies are new 
every morning, when new mercy wakes up and gives you permission to live, it's going to dispense to you the amount of faith you need for that day. The reason you stress about tomorrow, because you ain't got no faith for tomorrow. The reason tomorrow keeps you up, because you ain't got the substance to deal with tomorrow. He said, tomorrow will take care of itself. I got right now. You do not have faith for tomorrow. So he said, don't even take a thought for it. It's going to mess you up. See, this kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace. When you don't have joy and you don't have no peace, tell yourself, how did I get outside the kingdom? If you don't have joy and peace every day, all day, you can ask yourself this question, how did I get outside the kingdom? Because the kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have peace in something, when something happens, not if, when something happens, and you don't have peace and joy still, you stepped outside of the kingdom because of what happened. If you don't have a smile on your face, if you're not taking your medicine laughing, 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 laughing about this life, you don't got peace. Peace is quiet confidence. If you don't have that quiet confidence when something bad happens, a bad report, you step outside the kingdom. And the Father wants their safety and security in the kingdom. You ever see like those um, medieval movies and they got the castle and they got that big old wall. They got that big old huge gate. They even have, might have a moat. See, so the enemy got to get through all that stuff to get into the kingdom. So your Father got you some protection. He has a protect. The kingdom has a protection plan for you. Satan can't just come in like a flood. He can't do it. He's going to meet some resistance. He's going to meet some obstacles, obstacles trying to get to you. Long as you stay in the kingdom, it's when you step outside. He's walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour outside the kingdom. He can't come in the kingdom. He stays outside the kingdom waiting on a sheep wandering around in fear, wandering around in discouragement, wandering around in hate, wandering around in unforgiveness so he can devour them. Because none of that goes on in the kingdom. I'm going to give myself a love offering today. None of that is outside the kingdom. I bet you the kids understand this. Take no thought for them all. You can't say you love God and you don't love everybody else. The Bible calls you a liar. I just don't like them. You're not functioning in the culture. Luke 11, I'll just do a couple of scriptures. Understand this, you guys. The kingdom concept explains everything in this book. Teaching anything apart from the kingdom will result in some error. The kingdom is a place, it's a country, it's called heaven. It has a king called God, Yahweh, Father. If the government is a person, it's not a candidate, it's not a political figure. A king is one person that makes up all the laws. Do y'all remember the Shudamite woman? Y'all remember that story? And she had to leave town because the prophet wanted her to prosper. Now watch this. Oh, my God. Look at this revelation of the door just dropped on me. The prophet said, hey, baby, you have to go. It's going to be a famine for seven years. My house is here. My property is here. My business is here. And the, pro the prophet, oh, get the, ooh, ah, ah. The prophet told her to do what? The prophet told her to do what? To go. To leave. Not seven minutes. Not seven weeks. Not seven days. Not seven months. The prophet told her to leave. What? Say it's going to be a famine seven years. You got to go. Man, I thought you wanted me to prosper. <laughs> I'm going to leave my stuff. You got to go for seven years. I thought you were a prophet. I thought you wanted me to prosper. You got to leave town for seven years. 
She went. Came back seven years later. Things have gotten better. The economy's back on track. A stimulus check went out. Folk got their, <laughs> folk got their, their tax returns. You know, stuff is back to normal. So baby come back to town, to the king. She in line. Prophet telling the king about Isaiah. And he said, you know what? David, shoot my woman right there. He raised her son from the dead. The king, say the king. Okay. See, the one who makes laws by his word. The king said, bring her here to me. Let me, let me, let me, let me verify this witness. Have your testimony straight. When you're coming for the king, have your testimony straight. Have your testimony ready. Go ahead. You know what a lawyer do? Jason, what do y'all do to prepare your witness? What, do, what does prepping a witness mean? When you prepare the witness, you, you straighten out what they're going to say before they go on the stand so they don't say something wrong. You don't just get up there and start running off at the gym. You don't get up there and just start making up stuff. Not if you got a good attorney. Not if you got good counsel. They got you prepped. The Holy Spirit brings you here every week to get you prepped for your... just coming to church you coming to get prepped for a testimony you're gonna have to get for a case for a battle you your battle ain't flesh and blood your battle ain't fighting your battle is not against flesh and blood it's principalities and wicked spirits you got to be prepped you ain't in no army of the lord you ain't that's the angel's job you ain't in no army of the lord i'm a prayer warrior no you ain't you are a witness to give legal testimony so the man of God told her to get out of town for seven years. Didn't look like she was going to prosper. But now here she is, the king then called. The king says, come give me legal testimony. Tell me what happened. She told it. The king says, give her back her land. Give her back her house. Was she happy, y'all? But to him who's able to do, Desiree, exceedingly abundant. She asked for, king, can I just have my house back? King, can I just have my land back? And the king says, yes, but you know what? I'm going to give you seven years of income that you would have made to him who's able to do exceedingly. Uh, Ephesians was at work then, and it wasn't even no Ephesians. Ephesians. Exceedingly abundantly above all. She didn't ask for seven years of property, I mean of income. She just wanted to get her regular stuff back. You just want your regular stuff back, and the king wants to do more than you've asked, or you can't even think. <sighs> the law of favor kicked. The king made a law for her. The king will make a law for you. Because he could decree a thing. He can declare a thing. But guess what? So can you, because you are the king of many kings and the lord of many lords. You can decree a thing. Whew. Instead of complaining a thing, why don't you start decreeing a thing? Wow, 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 wow. It didn't look like what the man of God told her was cool. It didn't make no sense, did it? I'm a prosper, yeah. Came back seven years later. Got her socks blown off. Because the government, the king, he didn't have to vote. He didn't say, hey, y'all, can I do this? The king didn't ask, hey, hey, can the uh, satraps and the, and, the, and the governors, can y'all come tell me if I can get this woman her stuff back plus seven years of income? The king didn't have to ask nobody. Because his word is law. See, the president, the governor, the mayor, they got to they gotta check with the city council. They got to check with the senators. They got to check with the congressmen. And they all act a fool. The king ain't asking nobody for permission to bless you. The king ain't asking nobody for permission to heal you. The king is not asking anybody for permission to deliver you, to protect you. To give you victory. <sighs> Chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, he, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord Adonai, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. I told you last week, that word prayer there. Is where we get the word petition. The word is petition and it's translated into prayer. 
So Lord, teach us. Say, I need to be taught. Teach us how to petition the way John taught his disciples how to petition because John's disciples look like they got it going on and we struggling with our petitioning. So Yeshua said, when you petition, you got to say this, our father. That word father there, pather. That word father there, Abba. It means the source. It means the owner. It means the supplier. So that's a concept. So you are coming to the king, the source of everything, the owner of everything. This is not the Lord's prayer. You know what this is? I heard Jake and Charmaine and Florence doing something yesterday, and it gave me a word. What was y'all doing? The thank you cards, Jake? They were doing the thank you cards for the people that gave them the gifts. Okay? So Florence was on the computer pulling up a, what you call a program or, when you, you do a brochure, Desi, what do you? If you're going to do a brochure or something on template, that's that word. <laughs> she was telling Charmaine and Jake, now, now this, is, this is a template. When we have our memorial guys, when, when we do a service for somebody, and we have Westside Christian Center Memorial Guy, ain't that what y'all call, call it, Desi? A, a template. It's a blank form with a title on it. The title of this is Petitioning. It's a memorial guy. It's a thank you card. It's an invitation to a wedding, an invitation to a baby shower. But when you pull it up on the computer, you know what it is? What information is in it? None. It's blank. It's an outline. This is an outline for petitioning. This ain't no Lord's Prayer. He ain't told you to pray this till you go to heaven. He ain't tell you to pray this till he come back. He says, here's the outline. Here's the template. And this is what you put in it. You're going to address your bane. I mean, excuse me. You're going to address your Abba. You're going to address your Pather, the owner of everything. Stop calling that the Lord's Prayer. He didn't call it that. Why are you going to call it that? Because somebody else called it that. This is a template on to make your petition to the owner, the source, the supplier of everything. Jehovah Gaira, your provider. Our Father, that's a concept, the owner, source, who art in heaven, this nation, this place, this country, this unseen realm, that's where, that's where I'm petitioning. He ain't telling you to say, our Father who art in heaven. He ain't telling you to say that. He's, he's giving you location. He's giving you location. He's giving you location. He ain't telling you to get on your knees and say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy He ain't telling you to do that. That's a template. You're a, you are coming to the king, the source and the owner. You're approaching this place called heaven. Now, let me tell you about the name you're approaching. It's holy. You ain't got to tell God holy is his name. You, he don't need to know that. You need to know that. Our Father, who are holy is your name. I know my name. Holy, consecrated, set apart, unique, distinct, purpose. That's who you're approaching. That's who you're addressing. He know who he is, do you? Your kingdom come. Now, religious folk and uninformed folk will tell you you're so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. The devil wrote that scripture. Because it's impossible to be heavenly minded and not be awesome here. Your kingdom come. You are petitioning for his kingdom to come to your, to your house, to your job. To your, where, where I am, I need your kingdom. If you find yourself in danger, I need your kingdom here. Your government shows up. You, you see, um, I, don't, I don't know how I should use this word. Cowboys and Indians or cowboys and Native Americans. You know, those type of movies. <laughs> I'm trying to be PC. And I hurt nobody. Um, you know, and, and, the, and like say the Say if the soldiers is getting jacked up and you hear that bugle, what that mean? They call that the, the cavalry, the help is coming. The cavalry is coming. So, so, so you know, when, when you start praising, the cavalry is coming. The kingdom's coming. Your, your help is coming. Your, your protection is coming. So, 
Abba, source, supplier, owner of everything. The place that I'm positioning in, the unseen realm, the spirit realm. Now, I, I know his name is holy. I know he's unique. He's unlike anybody else. I, I, can't, I, can't just, I can't just act like I'm just talking to anybody, dealing with anybody. I'm dealing with the holy one. Yeah, and, and, it, and his government, I want it to come here. And I want his will to be done. You got to give him his will. You don't just pray your will be done. Okay, well, what is it then? You got to tell him. You got to state your, state your case and tell him what his will is. I, want, I need to be healed. Your will, according to this book right here, by his stripe, by your stripes of Yeshua, I'm supposed to be healed. That's your will. So I'm praying that will. I'm praying that will and testament. Give us this day our daily bread. Say daily bread. Daily bread. Now, he ain't talking about no sweet daddy cornbread. He ain't talking about no monkey bread. He ain't talking about no French rolls. He ain't talking about no, no uh, um, Panera bread. He ain't talking about none of that. That word bread, bread there, he's talking about your need for that day. Give us this day. Say day. day. My daily bread. Say daily bread. Because see, this book is called the bread of life. There ain't no loaf of bread. It, it contains life in it. And, and, and it's a food source, so to speak. So watch this. What do I need for this day? Do, do you need protection for this day? Do you need deliverance? Do you need help? Do you need finances for this day? So, so watch this. He's only going to give you what you need for that day. That's how this government works. I, 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 I want, I, 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 what, what about next week? Take those off for tomorrow. See, in this culture, in this kingdom, in this government system, the king just give you what you need for the day because he wants you to trust him. Your will be done on earth as it is in the Shamaim. Lord, I trust you to just give me what I need for today. Because I understand how your kingdom works. See, if you don't understand how the kingdom works, you're going to be worried about your bread for tomorrow, your need, your whatever, whatever pops up. Whatever pops up, you're going to be worried about it because you don't understand how this kingdom works. See, we've been functioning and working outside the kingdom. That's why stuff ain't been working. That's why we ain't had the peace and the joy and the contentment that we're supposed to have. Because we've been doing it the wrong way, looking at it the wrong way, understanding it the wrong way. He didn't come for us to have church, religion, meetings. He came for us to have life, a kingdom life, more abundantly to the full until it overflows. But... Give me that old time religion. And he don't have none. Ah, okay, y'all, I, I, I'm, I'm through. I'm through. Ooh, glory. Oh, my God.